Hey guys, this is Janine from Pangolin and today I would like to talk to you about how to utilize the dynamic range of your camera best to avoid noisy images. Grain and noise is something most photographers cringe at when looking at their images. Let's be honest, we detest it, which is why we are often willing to go to desperate measures to try and avoid it. However, we need to understand that trying to avoid high ISOs will force us to compromise on other light parameters, which invertedly can lead to the opposite effect of what we are trying to achieve by actually creating more noise than necessary. In this video, I will teach you how to avoid this pitfall by pointing out the four most common mistakes in settings that lead to too much noise in your image. Here with Pangolin Photo Safaris, we mostly specialize on nature and wildlife photography with our guest, while utilizing the natural light given to us to tell stories and create beautiful images. While we try to shoot our images correctly in camera, there's a few tricks you can keep in mind to increase the amount of detail that will be visible in the final outcome of your image. In order to do so, I will have to touch on a few technical parts of your exposure and histogram. But if you bear with me till the end, you'll be able to significantly reduce grain in your image and create a more detailed and clearer photograph. Due to the lack of control about our light conditions in wildlife photography, we often encounter technically difficult scenarios that drive our ISO up, such as low light conditions due to overcast weather, rain and dense vegetation, as well as wildlife activity before and after sunrise. However, we also encounter challenging setups from being forced to shoot high contrast images with a large variety of brightness levels in one single frame, such as dark and wet hippos in bright water, birds against the sky or leopards in a tree. What do these two scenarios have in common? Low light and high contrast often both struggle with deep shadows and badly exposed parts of the image. When faced with these dilemmas, we often fall back on creative techniques that allow us to concentrate only on the highlights or only on the shadows while intentionally clipping or crunching the brights and darks. Check out Sabina's tutorial about creative captures to learn more about that. However, sometimes we would like a more even exposure. This is where we need an in-depth understanding of our dynamic range. In a landscape shot, for instance, we would simply take multiple frames with different exposures and stack them in order to increase the amount of information both in the highlights and in the shadows without any compromise or loss of detail. In a wildlife shot, we are unable to so-called bracket an image with multiple exposures as the animal is moving. Therefore, we will have to utilize the full dynamic range of our camera. To keep you all on track with my train of thought, I quickly wanted to touch on what the dynamic range of your camera is. Don't worry, I won't take long. The dynamic range is the range of light your camera is able to capture and retrieve within a raw image. The larger the dynamic range of your camera, the more information you will find both in the highlights and in the shadows of your image. And you will be able to better save things like crinkles in an elephant, the eye color of a shady eye, highlights on wet animals or clouds in the sky. This being said, we need to understand that a camera will never be able to match the levels of dynamic range that our eyes can see. The human eye is one of the best eyes in the mammal kingdom, being able to see up to 21 stops of light. In comparison, None of the new flagship cameras of Sony, Canon, Nikon or Olympus even reach 15 stops of light. On top of that, we don't just take one frame with our eyes, but create composites in our mind by putting multiple frames together in which we can focus on different points, creating a well-exposed and incredibly sharp image. Due to the lack of dynamic range in our cameras, we're not able to recreate low light or high contrast images within one single frame 
the same way as we can see it unfolding in front of our eyes without running it through some form of post-production. So coming back to our challenge of how to avoid too much noise. Noise is the grainy look of our image when our ISO has gotten high. It diminishes our details and clarity in our animal. However, it is important to note that noise is predominantly found in the dark areas of an image. While light areas can also be noisy, the larger quantity is found in darker tones. And it doesn't stop at that. Noise is mostly found in areas that you try to brighten or lighten in retrospective to make the details come out. That happens any time you pull the shadows out of an image towards the plus side, which you will know if you do edit your images, happens in many cases, as we are usually trying to bring both more details into the dark areas by lifting the shadows and more details into the bright areas by taking unnecessary highlights out. A simple conclusion based on this observation is to avoid shooting so dark that you're required to pull out your shadows in post-production. We call it shooting to the right, as you tend to overexpose your shot a bit. Let me point out the four most common mistakes that will lead us to shoot too dark. And afterwards, I'll be able to show you the most important part of this tutorial, which is why a low ISO does not necessarily result in less noise. By the end, you should be able to utilize the existing dynamic range of your camera to the best of its ability. If our tutorials help you with your photography out in the field, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and press the like button so you don't miss out on our next video. Reason number one a lot of photographers like to shoot darker is to preserve the highlights. It is absolutely correct that it is easier to retrieve details in the shadows than it is in the highlights. Noisy details, but at least they're there. Once you clip your highlights, you will have a snow white spot that lacks any sort of information. Therefore, we try hard to avoid shooting too bright. Turning on your highlight alerts on your camera that will show you your blinkies is a very helpful tool to detect when you are clipping your white point. Also keep in mind that highlights are particularly important within your subject itself. Hotspots in clipped highlights in the background can be turned down without the lack of detail necessarily being a problem. Check out my tutorial on the new local adjustment masks in Lightroom to learn more about that. To sum it up, avoiding clipped highlights in your subject should not lead you to overcompensate by shooting too dark and creating deep shadows either. While you don't lose all information in the shadows, they simply won't look great. Try and find middle ground in order to create a high dynamic range image by shooting so bright that you just don't clip your white point. Your image will not look great in camera because neither the highlights nor the shadows are now properly visible as they might have been to your eye. However, in post-production, you will have enough information on both ends of your spectrum to bring the details of the highlights back in while pulling the shadows out without causing too much grain color noise, and distorted colors. The second reason a lot of photographers shoot slightly underexposed is to create a more saturated and contrast intense image. This is something that is particularly important when you are shooting a JPEG file. Your color style, white balance, and to some extent exposure determine the final look of your image as you do not have much information to play with. However, in a RAW file, it is not crucial that your image looks saturated and full of contrast to start out with. Matter of fact, a RAW file is a heap of information that still requires your input. You still have to put it all together and therefore any RAW file will look comparatively flat and lacks contrast. Do not shoot intentionally dark to tweak your RAW file to look punchy from the starting point. 
Rather try and shoot a correct exposure, which is determined by both your metering as well as your overall light distribution on your image. With evaluative matrix or multimetering, you will have to underexpose when your background is significantly darker than your subject and overexpose when your background is significantly brighter. Remember, as long as you don't burn your highlights, you will have a lot more clarity and detail in your final shot if you do not have to brighten your shadows. You do not lose any quality whatsoever if you lower your highlights in turn. So what I'm trying to say, while you should try and shoot as correctly as possible in camera, don't expect your LCD screen on the camera to show you a correct representation of your final edited RAW file. Therefore, a lack of contrast should not lead you to systematically underexpose. Rather, shoot brighter to avoid noise in the final outcome. Third, a lot of photographers shoot darker to allow for faster shutter speeds in wildlife photography. Having a fast shutter speed is absolute priority in wildlife photography as it will allow for crisp and sharp images. You need to freeze the motion in time to avoid motion blur. Shooting darker or to the left means you are asking for less light on your sensor. That in turn allows for your shutter to open and close faster on aperture priority. Therefore you avoid blurry images while keeping your ISO nice and low at the very same time. It seems like a win-win situation initially, but using your exposure as a tool to create a fast shutter is not the best approach. Having to pull the shadows out of the dark areas will create noise in those areas and therefore reduce the clarity and sharpness of your image after all. Rather open your aperture wide or utilize the correct ISO to achieve a fast shutter speed. Last but not least, number four, photographers shoot darker to keep the ISO low. In a very similar thought pattern to mistake number three, photographers cringe when their ISO reaches a certain level and start compromising by reducing the exposure to keep the ISO low. The darker the image, the less sensor sensitivity is required. It might be intentional or even unintentional as they don't notice for the first stop or two that the exposure has turned out darker than intended. It can be very difficult to keep paying attention to your exposure bar at all times. However, this approach is particularly harmful as noise levels increase exponentially in the darks the higher the ISO is. In other words, while you found noise in the darks on low ISOs, it will be so much worse on high ISOs. How much you can push your camera obviously depends on the individual sensors. A rule of thumb states that full frame, low megapixel and newer sensor can generally be pushed harder than a crop sensor, high pixel count or older camera. Regardless of your camera, please do not expect to shoot all wildlife images at an ISO of 800 and lower. It will often excel those values. To sum up mistake number four, Rather shoot at a higher ISO on a brighter image than a lower ISO on a darker image as the brighter shot will show less noise. Some of these solutions might sound counterintuitive to a photographer as it will require you to choose a higher ISO than you deem necessary. Therefore, I want to show you that ISO does not equal the same noise at all times. It depends on your exposure, how close you are to your subject, and the contrast in your image. This will be true irrespective to what brand or camera you're shooting. Some cameras might simply show it to a stronger degree than others, depending on their dynamic range and low light performance. I will show you a range of images shot both on different ISOs and exposures to show you that low ISOs does not necessarily equal less noise. Image number one. Check out these two shots of a hippo shot against a bright background taken with my 1DX2. The darker exposure 
which was shot on a much lower ISO, shows significantly more noise in the areas where I had to retrieve the detail by pulling the shadows out. The image with a much higher ISO seems to be much cleaner. Check out image number two. I know this topic is quite controversial with wildlife photographers and difficult to compare as camera bodies perform on different levels. How do you prefer to shoot? And have you found yourself struggling with noise in the dogs? Please leave me your experience in the comment section just below. At the end, it is about physics. And without going into too much technical detail in this specific tutorial, I hope my visual examples were able to show you the different effects your exposure and ISO levels have on the amount of grain you create within your image. Have fun exploring the dynamic range of your personal camera and remember that your raw image does not yet need to correspond to what you see with your own eyes. If you still struggle with noise, check out Charles Lightroom tips on our YouTube channel. I'll see you the next time. Bye bye.